Welcome to Monograph, a show celebrating Alabama's rich tapestry of creative works and artistic endeavors. I'm your host, Jackie Clay. For our summer 2020 broadcast, you'll notice production looks a little different in response to COVID-19. We'll share segments filmed both before and after the pandemic and check in remotely with two Monograph alums to hear how their organizations have adapted. The whole series of work is kind of about a longing for this physical connections because we're communicating on such a distant level right now. My name is Stacy Holloway. I'm the um, assistant professor of sculpture at UAB, but I'm also a local Birmingham artist. The series that I've done is called uh, Fabricated Interactions During Social Distancing. As soon as uh, the the current pandemic kind of hit, I started thinking a little bit more about um, how we connect with each other and that this is a time where we're not really allowed to do so. I've done this series of kinetic sculpture and wearable sculpture that would uh, mimic or simulate um, these physical connections that we, we usually do with each other. But thinking of the more kind of intimate interactions that we share with like family members. Um, so I'm really close to my mother. So a lot of these um, have to do with my mother or missing, you know, the kiss of your grandma. This very loving yet very aggressive way that grandparents kiss you. So I wanted to kind of simulate that kind of like, kind of quick smack on the cheek with the lipstick. As for my mother, I, uh, the two pieces that I made uh, for her, um, the first one was Eskimo Kiss, where I cast my nose and put it on a doorstop. Just the rubbing of the noses is, is it's very sweet and um, loving. So this is something that my mother used to do when we were little, it still does. Um, so I, I kind of missed that physical interaction with her. The lullaby piece where it's a headset, where I have an old tape recorder so I got her on the phone and made her <laughs> sing uh, You Are My Sunshine, which is a lullaby that she used to sing to us when we were little. And it's kind of my fondest memory of, of, of growing up with her as my mother is. Um, so that's kind of our song is the You Are My Sunshine song. So I recorded her singing that and it's kind of distorted because it's an old recorder. So how I start making these is I begin um, with taking a mold off of my body with rubber alginate, which is the same stuff that the dentists use to take a mold off of your teeth. From there, I have to cast uh, the body part in a, uh, a, a quick setting uh, polyurethane plastic. And then from that, I use silicone rubber to take a mold off of that, which then I can reuse that mold over and over. That's where I'll use a, um, a silicone that is used for um, the film industry. So it's uh, supposed to simulate skin. So um, you can also pigment it, add pigment to it, um, and uh, tint it whatever you want. That's how I get the actual cast of the body. Um, so using that silicone, so it does actually simulate human skin, the human touch. Um, and then from there, I just build these kind of strange contraptions out of scrap wood or um, found objects from my house or from the studio until I, I kind of build these until I get the interaction that I want or the movement that I want. My new favorite sculpture from this series is uh, the hug. I've realized, you know, a lot of people have said that when you hug someone, it kind of releases, you know, some of these hormones or whatever. It, it feels really good to hug somebody. And so I think that one is my new favorite one because I, you, it, you really, you can actually kind of clench it tight and it's nice and soft and plush. High five is, is really satisfying and this, this, the contraption that I made for the high five actually feels, you know, really realistic and really satisfying. 
That kind of became a ritual when I left the studio every night was to do a jump high five, um, with, you know, like, good job in the studio today. I'm here with Viola Ratcliffe of Bib and Tucker Sew Up in Birmingham, Alabama. So how long have you been quarantined personally and how long have folks at Bib and Tucker been like working remotely, if, if you're working remotely? So I've been quarantined since mid-March, which will put us at like three months. We have a group of members, our Tuesday group, that is used to meeting there weekly every Tuesday from 11 to 3. And that has happened for like almost 10 years that the SOAP has been, um, pretty much ever since the SOAP has been established. And we have not met since the quarantine and the shutdown. So that has been probably the most challenging thing. So describe describe Bib and Tucker for us, like pre-COVID, um, what some people are calling the great before. <laughs> describe Bib and Tucker in the great before. And uh, then also kind of how you guys are imagining, how you guys are organizing now and how you're kind of imagining the future. So I guess with the great before, uh, we were pretty busy. <laughs> we had um, programs that we were running on a very regular basis. Our Tuesday group was the most regularly meeting program. So that was happening every Tuesday. But then we were ramping up towards summer. So we were very much in planning phase. Uh, we were getting ready for a lot of exciting things. And then COVID happened and it just, you know, with everybody, you hear about it, and at first you're like, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna have to adjust a little bit. And then you're like, okay, we're, no, we're gonna have to adjust a little bit more. Then you're like, oh, wait, no, no, we're going home. <laughs> like, we're done. And then once we were at home and we kind of, I, I personally spent the week just kind of floundering, like, I don't really know what I'm supposed to be doing, you know, answering emails, basically canceling a lot of stuff <laughs> was my first week. And then uh, we kind of got a plan together and we figured out how we wanted to move in this COVID environment. And so one of the priorities for us was maintaining the Tuesday group in some capacity, making sure we were still offering programming to the community, but trying to figure out how do you offer sewing programming when you can't physically be with somebody to teach them or show them how to sew. Uh, and then the face masks. So that kind of just happened organically. So we just kind of started doing that as a sew-op. So for a, like a month, that was really intense. Like we were just making face masks, like hard, hitting it very hard. Uh, so many of our members came through just making sometimes hundreds of masks a week even, um, just contributing where they could, giving money, giving materials. So that was a huge part of spring for us. So uh, what are some of the things you guys are working for, working toward in the future? So we are looking towards fall, um, and we have a couple of things that we want to do come fall 2020. One is Recycled Runway. It is our annual fashion extravaganza. It's our event that we love to do. It's an upcycle fashion show. So this will be the fourth year that we've done it. And uh, with COVID, it's actually really interesting trying to plan an event with the plan B of possibly not being able to be in a space with a lot of people where in the past it's like, let's get as many people here as we can. And now we're looking at, okay, so how can we still have the same feeling without so many people in the room possibly? And then we're also hopefully gonna have a quilt show. Our Tuesday group has been working very diligently towards having a quilt show in the fall. Most likely we're gonna have more. We may do another installment of Magic City Seams Junior for the fall because we're really looking at programming that we can offer year round virtually, especially with, um, I think a lot of schools are gonna be looking towards virtual programming and then the homeschool um, community. Well, um... Viola, thank you so much. Uh, this has been really enjoyable. And um, stay safe. And yes. uh, we'll see you again. Yes, thank you guys so much for having us. It was great talking to y'all. We are in Opelika, Alabama at The Nest, which is the coffee space associated with the Chirpwood Art Gallery. My name is Scott Moody, and this is my place. We started out as a picture frame company Instead of buying molding, uh, we decided to make our molding from scratch. When my wife said it's time to leave the basement barn and garage of our house and, and have a, an actual commercial spot, we chose this location because we could manufacture on one side and retail out the other. The people who liked us first were artists, and there really was no place in Opelika for local art. So we 
became an art gallery, sort of accidental. We're an accidental art gallery. We have a patent pending frame, we call a two stick frame. And most importantly, uh, half our profits goes to something called Bridge to Rwanda, the scholars program there. And I spend about a month a year in Rwanda these days teaching. And so that's the purpose behind it all. I'm an electrical engineer by degree out of Auburn. I felt that my calling in life was to teach. So I went back and got a master's in mathematics education. And I was in the high school classroom for 25 years teaching calculus and physics and robotics. When I got to the next phase of my life, I wanted to do things I hadn't done before. So I wanted to do something uh, for purpose, to be a platform of influence and a vehicle for good. I wanted to do something entrepreneurial and I wanted to do something uh, that let me be creative. We started out uh, truly not knowing what we were doing. The, the thing that I had going for me is that I'm a really detail-oriented person and I have a good eye. And so I knew what I wanted my frames to look like. For the first, I hate to admit it, almost year that I was trying to do chirpwood, I was mainly experimenting with recipes. I took every combination of stain, oil, if you take you know, steel wool and put it in vinegar and you get a solution that will age wood, things like that. And I really worked on getting patina. I would walk in the woods and look at weathering pieces of wood and I would say, what makes that have a look that is an authentic look? And I, and I decided that it takes at least three colors and it, it, there's a texture and a lot of different things that combine to make patina. We have two types of wood we use. We have solid uh, native oak and we have solid native pine. Once that goes through the molder, we cut miters, we wire brush if we need to, to uh, age the wood. And at that point we glue it and put it together with a, a dovetail system. And once the glue is dried, we have a sanding table where we hand sand every single piece that goes out. And that's actually more delicate than you might think. You're sanding it before it's finished, but sometimes it'll be finish one, come back to the sanding table, finish two, come back to the sanding table. Most of the things that we sell have at least three trips to and from. We used to paint it all by hand. Turns out that's uh, hard to get much production if you paint it all by hand. So we now have a, a one little sprayer and we keep our different paints in different uh, mason jars. Doing things that aren't cookie cutter kind of sets us apart. I had a, a company that we love and that we've done business with for a while. They asked me to come up with a, a less expensive way and easier to transport frame. And there's a generic term, something called a poster rail. They have magnets sometimes. And he asked me if I would consider making something like that. I thought, why do you need two pieces of wood on top and two pieces of wood on the bottom? You just need a wood with a groove in it. And I fiddled around with clips for a little while and lo and behold, it worked. And, and I thought, I can make the same patina, the same handmade look uh, with these, this poster rail system. Starting a business out of nothing, except your ideas, it's hard. And, and, and every single step of the way, I just don't, it's amazing that anybody is, is successful sometimes. It seems that way anyway. Uh, and, and so that's been my, one of my takeaways, just when you see somebody who's got that little small business, but they manage to support a family, just how amazing that is. Now we are with um, Elizabeth Elliott from Alabama Contemporary Art Center in Mobile. And uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing, I'm doing all right. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your organization um, during the great before, pre-COVID, pre and then how things are now. So before, before uh, we shut down on March 17th, um, we, like pretty much every other museum and cultural institution in Mobile, um, was having what was described as a banner year. We were doing really great. And we had um, 26 different public programs and events that got canceled pretty much immediately. The number is probably closer to 40 now, um, but that was what we counted up in the first three weeks of the shutdown. Aside from sort of 
crisis management and um, sort of the direct buckling down and you know cutting every ounce of fat out of our budget that we could, one of the things that was really important to us to do was to figure out how to fulfill our mission without so creating social space. So we took whatever pennies that we could scrape together that we were saving because you know our utility bill went down um, and we reallocated that to micro commissions and so the bulk of what we've been doing in the last three months are rolling out uh, programs that are small commissions for artists to make responsive work we had a big postcard campaign um, we've done yard art projects um, and just we keep trying to find money and reasons to cut checks to artists. Still, I know that you guys are working toward reopening. Do you guys have a, a plan? Um, what's happening? To be quite honest, I don't think we'd be opening in June if it weren't for all of the artists and curators that we're trying to maintain support of. So for June, we are doing, a, I say, a soft reopening um, We've cut our hours down to Thursdays through Saturdays, 11 to 5. Um, we've got an open call for volunteers um, that are able-bodied and healthy. And so for me, as you know, the director of the organization, it really has to be about choice. Um, I don't feel like during this time we can ask or make anybody come to work. Um, especially given the fact that like front of line staff is usually your lowest paid staff. And to, to put them in front of the public um, where there's a direct health risk is amoral. <laughs> but because our galleries are massive, we've got about 16,000 square feet of exhibition space, it's really easy to social distance in our galleries. The other thing we're doing is we're actually waiving admission for the rest of the 2020. Um, part of that is an acknowledgement of the economic pain that our entire community is feeling right now. Um, it's also removal of a point of contact and a risk um, for that front of line staff and volunteers that do work the front desks. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your time with us and uh, sharing your vision of the future and uh, we will make sure to stay tuned to everything coming up with Alabama Contemporary Art Center. Hey, thanks. My ancestors came to the Wallace Plantation right after slavery, probably in the next five years. And uh, some of my family lived here. Well, I had an uncle that lived on the property until the 1970s. And, uh, and then I had another cousin that lived here until around 1990, 91. It's more common than most people would think. They were not slaves here. Uh, however, I have friends in the community and people that have come back for events whose ancestors were uh, enslaved on this, on this property. And a lot of them live, live closely. My great-great-grandfather is the person who founded the house, and it was built in 1841. It's been in continuous possession of our family. The house had been vacant for uh, probably 50 or 60 years. I s rather unexpectedly inherited it, and so that's when Theo and I began conversation in earnest about what to do. What could the house mean? Will there be a new purpose for the house? Uh, how can the house help the community? Migratus Adaraxia is an opportunity to explore the enslaved existence of Africans in antebellum plantations. When we go to these antebellum spaces, plantations, the house is already performing whiteness. Docents are talking about the material culture, the silverware, the china, the drapes, the furniture, all from Europe. And there's no acknowledgement of labor other than they were servants. 
And so that really sparked our curiosity when we started to pull in a scholar from Bates uh, College, a uh, visual performance artist, Michaela Pilar Brown was working with us. And something beautiful happened here too because we spent so much time talking to the community. A number of the items in the installation are, are things from this community. Photographs from this community, books from this building, from this family, um, cotton picked in the fields behind this house, um, items that are, that resonate with the history of this place. And that felt like it was really something that kind of anchored the project differently. I mean, we have a set show, but just depending on how the audience's vibe is, we work off of that completely. And so I think they have to be really ready to just kind of let their guard down. And it's not going to be like being in a theater where you sit back and you just visualize the, the performance. It's not just about you watching the performance, but the performers watching you. The other audience members watching you watch the performance. You watching everybody. So everyone is a witness and everybody is a part of the performance. And that can be intimidating for an audience. So you have to really find how do you engage them and not push them away, but engage them and welcome them to be more participatory in the, in the experience. And not particularly that we want you to jump out and dance with us, but the idea that the, the emotions that maybe we have are okay. It's not, in, in essence, built to make anyone feel any particular kind of way, but it's built to enliven those enslaved Africans' existence in a concrete way and in an imaginary way, because some aspects of it we don't know. So we have to imagine what was possibly a part of their humanity. We also had to talk about not just the terrors, of slavery, but the humanity of it and how those people were able to survive. They loved each other. I think a lot of stories about enslaved Africans have to do with their bodies, what happens to the physical body, um, but very little about, you know, how they live, how they love, what happens to their spirit in these spaces. And we never get that narrative, that humanized narrative of the enslaved individuals that they could not have survived unless they had love. We can all come together and really see how the elements of slavery set the foundation of connectivity and humanity for the survival purposes in, the, in these worlds that we live in that are very much about erasure. Where do black bodies matter? Do they matter? And in what spaces do they find sort of um, confidence in their existence? And so this idea of like we needed to make a performance or make something that reflects the spaces where we're not seen. What does it look like to witness someone else's grief? And how open are you to feeling that grief? And does that start a conversation? that allows people to bring their histories together and then share a narrative as opposed to having two very oppositional narratives. For me, I'm originally from Alabama. This is a homecoming of sort for my company, our company. We've been sort of exploring Southern life and sort of black existence in the South for the last 15 years and making work about it. Southern life and Southern existence is legitimately a part of the American landscape. The Civil War that happened, it fractured our nation, but then it's called the United States. We're still one nation. This piece has elements of reaching back to reach forward because we still deal with elements of plantocracy in our contemporary existence. One night, they pull audience members to sit down. Of course, the dancers, the dancers didn't know they were who the audience members were. Uh, but they pulled Nail, Nail set. Then they pulled uh, one of my relatives, uh, who had never been here. They had her sand, and then they pulled a descendant of uh, one enslaved people to sit. So Nell was on one side of the table, uh, the descendant of one of the sharecroppers was on the other side, and the descendant of the enslaved. They didn't know how powerful that was to me, but they had brought all of them to the table, 
And, uh, and that brought tears to, uh, to my eyes. Well, it was a, a truly emotional moment for me, you know, from the first moment when the, you know, they were beginning with the music and the rehearsals to have music come into the house again because it had been vacant for so long and had had no life for so long that this was a beginning. And then, you know, bringing the embodiment of black presence to the house, which it had never had. I mean, it, it actually, of course, had had. You know, the house was built by enslaved people, and people worked in it for many years, but that had never been acknowledged in the narrative. And so what we're trying to do in Klein Arts and Culture is to change that narrative and to make it a, a truly shared narrative and shift it through what we do. And there couldn't have been anything better than Migratus to have done that. I think it is uh, incorporating the total story. It, it means a lot uh, for healing, for uh, conversations. And preservation with a purpose means for us that it's not enough just to restore the house. It's not enough just for it to be on the Alabama Historic Registry, which it's been on since the 1950s, I think. We aren't restoring the house. We're stabilizing it and leaving it as it was in uh, the early 20th century. So it's never going to have, you know, the creature comforts. And we want... Um, we want it to be raw and we want it to show sort of how things were. This is about the patina, if you can see walls behind here, it's about the patina of the walls and you know the, the last layer is wallpaper that was put in in the 50s. And then it goes all the way back to the original you know, plaster. So we want it always to be seen as you can see there were layers of history and there are layers of meaning in this house. And we're adding, I guess, a new layer of meaning by the work that we're doing here. The Wallace House, Klein, is one of the landmarks in Harpersville. And so everybody talks about the house. And there's something really important to me about doing it in a rural setting, that you can have this interdisciplinary arts experience that's fully engaged, and it doesn't have to be in a city. It can be right here in the community. You know, and we are going to change the narrative. We can change what we have as our small sphere, and that's what we're working on.